whoever arranged the uh, 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 this evening's events uh, should be congratulated for their good timing. Uh, the topic is United States and the United Nations. It's uh, the meetings on the occasion of a day in honor of UNESCO. Uh, the United States has, uh, UNESCO is one of the proudest achievements of the United Nations. It's also been an object of considerable disdain by the US government uh, since its founding back in the mid 1940s. Uh, back at then the US insisted on cutting its budget to the bare bones. And uh, just a couple of days ago, as you know, uh, the US cut off its funding for UNESCO completely in punishment for uh, UNESCO's adhering to the will of the overwhelming majority of the world and admitting uh, Palestine as a member. Now, that's not the first time. In 1984, uh, the, this is part of the general Reagan attack on the United Nations. In 1984, uh, the US withdrew completely from UNESCO, so funding and participation uh, in punishment for its kind of third world orientation. I'll return to that briefly. And there's also a lot to say about the specific issue of uh, US, Israel, Palestine, and the UN. Again, I'll make a couple of comments about that later on. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that there's a sharp split in the United States uh, in, with regard to attitudes towards the United Nations. Uh, the general population has, shown by polls, has been uh, consistently quite supportive of the United Nations. In fact, the majority believe that uh, the United Nations, not the United States, should take the lead in international crises, uh, that the United States ought to follow the will of the majority, even if it doesn't like it, and uh, in fact, the majority of the general population uh, even believe that uh, the United States and other countries should abandon the veto uh, at the Security Council and simply go along with the will of the majority. Well, that's uh, very remote from uh, anything that can reach public discussion. And elite attitudes in general have been uh, quite different and in fact have varied over time in very striking ways. So in the early days of the United Nations, late 1940s, early 50s, there was quite str a strong elite support for the UN. Uh, you have to recall the circumstances. At that point, at the end of the Second World War, the United States was at the height of its power. In fact, had achieved a position of power that had no historical precedent whatsoever. The US literally had half the world's wealth uh, during the Second World War, the United States had prospered. Uh, the war ended the Depression with a huge stimulus, state stimulus to production. Industrial production virtually quadrupled. Uh, the U.S. Had, had been the richest country in the world half a century before, but this propelled it way beyond. Uh, other industrial societies were severely damaged or destroyed as was much of the world, uh, that the competitors were gone. The U.S. had unparalleled security, controlled the entire Western Hemisphere, uh, controlled both oceans, controlled the opposite sides of both oceans. Uh, all of that was uh, without parallel. And it's uh, typically the case that enormous power that carries with it uh, enormous demands and expectations. And this was no exception. We have a good record of wartime planning. And of course, we know how the planning was implemented in the post-war years. And wartime planning and its implementation reflected uh, the assumption, fairly explicit, that the United States uh, was going to control the world and ought to control the world for its own good. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so plans were developed. Uh, the uh, great uh, American radical pacifist uh, A.J. Musty uh, 
not too well known, but I think one of the most important 20th century figures in the United States. At the time, he observed that uh, the problem uh, after a war is with the victor. Uh, the victor thinks he's shown that violence pays. Uh, who will teach him a lesson? I think those are words that should be heeded and tell us a lot about post-war history. Well, in any event, in those circumstances, uh, it's uh, uh, pretty obvious why the U.S. Uh, elite uh, opinion strongly supported the United Nations. The United Nations was uh, essentially an instrument in the hands of the United States uh, used to uh, uh, further its Cold War objectives. It was uh, easy to muster UN support for flogging the Russians. Uh, the uh, 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 the uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, developed was kind of interesting. The uh, the Russians, of course, as the uh, UN was used as an instrument against the Russians, of course the Russians objected, and there were a lot of Russian vetoes. Uh, there was then uh, uh, extensive discussion among uh, prestigious American and British intellectuals to try to explain why the Russians were so negative why did they keep saying no at the Security Council? Uh, I was a graduate student at the time. One of the uh, popular theories put forth by famous anthropologists that the Russians are negative uh, because they raise their children in swaddling clothes, and that makes them very negative. Uh, we used to call it diaperology. Uh, but uh, uh, that uh, began to change in... Uh, the 1950s and the 60s, but uh, let me say a word first about American power. Uh, the, there's an, a, a very common theme today discussed all over the place is what's called American decline. You take a look at the current issue of uh, the major establishment Journal of International Affairs, the Journal of Foreign Affairs of the Council on Foreign Relations. A uh, big front page headline asks the question, is America over? has American decline proceeded so far that we're done. There's a usual corollary to that, that somehow power is shifting to China. That's a, an illusion. China's economic growth is spectacular, but it's a poor country. It's uh, uh, no chance in the foreseeable future that it'll be a hegemonic power. Uh, but there's more to say about American decline. It's true that it's taking place. A lot of it, in fact, is self-inflicted in recent years. But an important observation is that it's nothing new. Again, the peak of American power was in around 1945. And the decline began right away. Uh, in 1949, uh, remember that the plans for US global hegemony, which were quite explicit, were that the United States would control the Western Hemisphere control the entire Far East and control the former British Empire, which includes, of course, the energy producing regions and as much of Europe as possible, the commercial industrial centers at least. But in 1949, uh, China became independent. There's an interesting uh, phrase that's used to describe that in the international affairs literature, that's called the loss of China. Uh, you should think about the phrase. Uh, I can't lose your watch because I don't own it. You can only lose something that you possess. And the phrase, which is never challenged, is based on the tacit assumption that, of course, we own China. We own the world. And if it moves towards independence, we've lost it. Uh, very revealing terminology. Tells you a lot about the culture. It goes on right until today. Well, from then on, 1949, there have been, there's been further decline and further efforts to pr uh, pr uh, prevent loss of uh, other parts of the world that we're supposed to own. Uh, well, going back to uh, the United Nations, uh, in the early years, it was an instrument of US power, lots of Russian vetoes. Uh, but by the early 1950s, that was beginning to change. 
uh, partly other countries were reconstructing from wartime damage, and the process of decolonization was beginning its agonizing course, uh, which made the United Nations much more uh, representative of uh, uh, global views, the so-called third world, the global south, happens to be the vast majority of the world. Uh, New York Times uh, diplomatic correspondent Barbara Crosette writes that by the 1960s, Moscow and many newly independent nations were isolating and vilifying the United States. In fact, the situation was so bad that by 1966, uh, the United States began to veto Security Council resolutions. And prior to that, it was unnecessary because the UN was pretty much an instrument of US power, but not from the mid-60s. Uh, since the mid-60s, the United States is far in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions. Britain is second, uh, France is a distant third, and the other two countries aren't within shouting distance. Well, that's not exactly the way it's described. If you look at uh, current press coverage, it tells you that, uh, quote the Washington Post, uh, the image that's engraved on world consciousness is of grim-faced Russian ambassadors casting vetoes, which was true 60 years ago, uh, but it hasn't been true for 50, 40, 40 years. It's been the opposite. Grim-faced U.S. ambassadors and British ambassadors, secondly. But that's not part of the world's consciousness, given the way the world is presented to us. Well, these uh, aberrant uh, attitudes of the world have caused considerable concern in elite circles. So in 1984, uh, New York Times cultural correspondent uh, Richard Bernstein uh, had an article in the New York Times Magazine which was devoted to the uh, isolation of the United States at the United Nations. The title was The UN Versus the US, uh, not incidentally the US versus the UN, which has a rather different connotation. Uh, point is that if, the, if there's a conflict between the US and the world, uh, the, U, the world is out of step. Uh, you read other commentary, it uh, says the other countries of the world ought to join the team and get in the mainstream of diplomacy. The team is us, and the mainstream is what we do, even if everybody else is out of it and they got to join in. Uh, at the time that uh, Bernstein was writing, mid-80s, uh, the United States was even vetoing resolutions that called on all states to observe international law and it began to refuse to pay its uh, legally obligated funding for the United Nations altogether. 1984 quit UNESCO. Uh, the reasons for quoting, quitting UNESCO are kind of interesting. Uh, one reason, major reason, was that the organization was allegedly trying to initiate what was called a new information and communication order, which it was claimed would require a licensing of journalists and other constraints on the free press. The charges, in fact, were total fabrication, but they were echoed, echoed constantly in the media, they still are, and efforts by UN officials and others to publish rebuttals that were simply barred from the media. Uh, if you're interested in this remarkable story, there's a very good book about it, uh, published by University of Minnesota Press, uh, called Hope and Folly, uh, Preston, Herman, and Schiller. I won't go on with it because it's well described. Well, that's, uh, 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 that's uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, mid-'80s. Uh, the uh, reasons why the United States had to veto resolutions calling for observance of international law uh, also tell us a lot. They're instructive. Uh, what had happened at that time, uh, the occasion for this, was that the World Court, the International Court of Justice, had just condemned the United States for its terrorist war against Nicaragua. It had called on the United States to uh, terminate what it called the unlawful use of force. It's a technical term for terrorism, international terrorism, and to pay huge reparations to Nicaragua. 
uh, well, the, uh, uh, the UN, the World Court, which is the judicial organ of the United Nations, uh, the World Court was immediately bitterly condemned by the press. Uh, the uh, uh, New York Times editors uh, uh, declared, wrote that the World Court is a hostile forum, uh, so it doesn't matter what it decides. A couple of years earlier, the same editors had been praising the World Court because it had sided with the United States in a conflict with uh, Iran, but now it was condemning the U.S. for its international terrorist operations, so it's a hostile forum and therefore irrelevant. The bipartisan Congress immediately uh, passed an increase in uh, aid to the Contras, the terrorist force that was attacking Nicaragua. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and actually, the, uh, the, there, there, there were at the time three countries that had rejected world court decisions, uh, Libya, Albania, and the United States. Uh, the United States is now in splendid isolation. I think it's the only country that's rejected a world court decision, still does. Well, the background is also instructive, uh, not too well known, but should be. The International Court of Justice was established by the UN Charter in 1945, and it has rules. Uh, the rules are that uh, states must agree to its jurisdiction. Can't uh, deal, if a state says you know, doesn't accept its jurisdiction, then World Court can't act. Well, the, when the World Court was founded, began to work, operate in 1946, the U.S. did agree to uh, uh, World Court jurisdiction, but with a reservation, a rather crucial reservation. Uh, the U.S. Would, be, uh, would have to be exempt from any charges that had to do with international treaties, like the U.N. Charter or the Charter of the Organization of the American States. Uh, that means that the U.S. declared that it is free to violate international law. And uh, the Nicaragua case was a case in point. Uh, the case for Nicaragua was in fact presented by a, a very distinguished international lawyer, a professor at Harvard Law School, Abe Chase, been in the government in fact. Uh, but the World Court threw out most of his case because the case was uh, based on the charge, charges of aggression, which were the actual phenomena. and that. Uh, the U.S. is exempt from that because it, its, its reservation uh, excludes uh, uh, violations of the U.N. Charter, the Charter of the OAS. So he had to restrict the case to very narrow grounds, and, uh, namely a bilateral a Nicaraguan U.S. Uh, Nicaragua U.S. treaty and uh, uh, common international law unformulated. Uh, that, uh, but nevertheless, on those narrow grounds, it still condemned the U.S. and called for massive reparations. Well, that's, uh, uh, the, all of this extends beyond. So a couple of years, in 1948, the United Nations passed the uh, Genocide Convention, convention con criminalizing the crime of genocide. Uh, the U.S. took a long time to ratify it. It was 40 years, in fact. Uh, but after 40 years, the U.S. did ratify it, but with a reservation. Namely, the U.S. is exempt. The U.S. cannot be brought to the court for the charge of genocide. Actually, that happened in, 19, in the year 2000. Uh, Yugoslavia brought a case to the International Court of Justice uh, charging the NATO powers with various crimes and their bombing of Serbia. And one of the charges was genocide whatever you think of the charge, not, not much, but uh, that was one of the charges. So the U.S. Uh, simply approached the court and said that it could not, the, the court jurisdiction did not apply to the United States because the United States is free to commit genocide. That's exactly what the reservation stated. And the court accepted that correctly, accepted that, and the U.S. alone was exempt from the court proceedings. The other NATO powers had to continue. Uh, that's... Uh, pretty general. The same is true of uh, the uh, International Convention on Torture. There's a lot of discussion these days about how the Bush administration carried out torture, uh, Obama's refusing to prosecute, and so on. 
but there's uh, some things missing there. The United States never really signed the, never ratified the Convention on Torture. Actually, it did ratify it formally, but as always, with reservations. Uh, the U.S. ratified it after the Senate had rewritten the International Convention to exclude a certain category of torture. And if you look at that category, it's the category of torture authorized by the CIA. Exactly that category of torture was excluded from the U.S. Uh, 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 acceptance of the torture convention. Now, most of the torture carried out by Bush under the Bush administration actually falls within that exclusion. So it's not so clear that uh, all these horrors uh, that have aroused such anger were actually illegal under U.S. law. And this uh, it continues very broadly. The U.S. almost never signs uh, uh, General Assembly conventions. The the way it's supposed to work, the you know, the, the, there are declarations, rights declarations and so on, then the General Assembly is supposed to uh, pass conventions about implementing them. And there are lots of those conventions. But if you look, you find that the U.S. has signed very few of them. And when it does ratify them, which is sometimes the case, uh, there are reservations excluding the United States uh, uh, from the uh, falling under the convention. Uh, they're called non-self-executing. Uh, they're inapplicable to the United States without specific U.S. legislation, uh, which is not forthcoming. Um, most conventions are just never signed, like the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been signed by every state, with two exceptions, the United States and Somalia. Uh, Somalia, because it doesn't have a government, uh, and if you look through the list, that's approximately the way it is across the board. Well, this all reflects the uh, assumptions of the immediate post-war period that U.S. power is so overwhelming by right uh, that it should not be subject to uh, any international supervision, uh, of course, UN or anything else. Well, there are many similar examples, and for now, these reasons, the United States is a textbook illustration of uh, what is called in the international affairs literature a rogue state. That is a state that rides roughshod over international treaties and other obligations. Actually, the most extreme form of violating international obligations is a Security Council veto. Now, that just eliminates the, uh, uh, the obligation. Uh, but in many other ways, too, including those I mentioned. And that hasn't passed without comment uh, in elite circles. So in the late 90s, uh, prestigious voices uh, observed, I'm quoting, that the U.S. was becoming the rogue superpower considered by much of the world to be the single greatest external threat to their societies and that the prime rogue state today in the world is the United States. Now, these were incidentally not marginal voices. Now, that's uh, Samuel Huntington, a highly respected uh, Harvard professor, and uh, Robert Jervis in his presidential address for the American Political Science Association. So not marginal voices, but they were drowned out in a quite remarkable chorus of self-adulation that I think has no counterpart in intellectual history. This is the 1990s. At that time, Clinton's foreign policy was described by prominent intellectuals as entering a noble phase with a saintly glow. For the first, I'm quoting now, for the first time in history, a country is guided by altruism alone and dedicated to principles and values, an idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity which at last could carry forward unhindered the emerging uh, international norm of humanitarian intervention uh, leading to a magnificent future. Actually, much of Western intellectual commentary in those years uh, sounded kind of like North Korea, uh, adulation of Kim Il-sung, it's no exaggeration. Of course, not surprisingly, not everyone was so enraptured uh, in the global south, the traditional victims, uh, they saw it 
quite differently. So they bitterly condemned what they called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, uh, which they recognized to be just the old right of imperialist domination. And they adopt the same stance with regard to the Western version of the currently fashionable notion of responsibility to protect, R2P as it's called in the literature. It's interesting that the Western version is interestingly different from the world version. There is a world version of R2P. It was passed by the General Assembly uh, of, of, of the United Nations in 2005, all very much on the international agenda today. And it's worth looking closely at how the United States and a few of its allies uh, diverge from the world. Uh, very important insight into tonight's topic, particularly important because it's never discussed, although it should be. Uh, the Western version of R2P appears in a 2001 document whose primary author is uh, former Australian Prime Minister Gareth Evans. He's lauded in the West as the father of R2P. But his version is crucially different from the world version. In the crucial paragraph, the Evans report considers the following situation. We consider a situation, I'm quoting now, in which the Security Council rejects a proposal for intervention or fails to deal with it in a reasonable time. In that case, uh, the report authorizes action within area of jurisdiction by regional or sub-regional organizations is subject to their seeking subsequent authorization from the Security Council. Now, if you look at what was going on then, you can see that that paragraph was explicitly tailored to apply retrospectively to the bombing of Serbia uh, two years before. That had been forcefully condemned by the global south, almost all the world. Uh, but this provision of R2P is designed to authorize it. And it, in fact, authorizes the powerful uh, to use force at will. And the reason is very clear. The powerful unilaterally determine when they can use force and determine what is their area of jurisdiction. Uh, the Organization of American States can't do that. The African Union can't do that. In fact, no regional organization can do it except for NATO. That's the one that can do that. So this is an authorization for use of force by NATO. And it does it. Uh, unit NATO unilaterally determined that its area of jurisdiction included the Balkans and that it could use force there uh, without uh, uh, Security Council authorization. Uh, rather interestingly, and this is also never discussed, uh, the area of jurisdiction does not include NATO itself. Uh, their shocking crimes were being committed against Kurds in southeastern Turkey through, right through the 90s, all off the agenda for a very simple reason. The decisive military and diplomatic support was being provided by the Clinton administration. In fact, that support peaked in 1997, the very year in which Clinton was praised for the noble phase of his foreign policy with a saintly glow. Uh, well, this all passes without comment. Uh, NATO later determined that its area of jurisdiction extended to Afghanistan, as you know, and well beyond. In 2007, NATO's mission was formally extended, quoting it, to guarding pipelines that transport oil and gas directed to the West, and more generally, to protecting sea routes used by tankers and other crucial structure of the energy system. Now that makes NATO a global intervention force, of course, at the command of the United States, uh, extending worldwide in its area of jurisdiction and its right to use force under the Western version of R2P. Now these expansive rights, accorded by the Evans report, are in practice restricted to NATO alone, this radically violating the principles uh, adopted by the General Assembly. 
and they explicitly leave the door open for resort to R2P as a weapon of imperial intervention at will. Those are important topics. They should be uh, the topic of uh, extensive discussion, but if you look hard, you'll find very little commentary on them. Uh, the reason is, again, the tacit assumption uh, that we own the world, so anything we do has got to be legitimate. Uh, sometimes we lose part of the world that we own, like China, uh, South America in the last decade, but you know that's something wrong with that. Got to do something about it. Well, this issue has just arisen in the case of Libya. Actually, there were two interventions in Libya worth bearing in mind. One intervention was under a Security Council resolution, resolution 1973. Uh, which called for a no-fly zone and the use of all necessary means to protect civilians. Uh, that intervention lasted about five minutes. The three traditional imperial powers, uh, France, England, and the United States, instantly violated it and simply uh, be decided to become the uh, uh, air force of the uh, rebel forces. There's nothing in the resolution that justifies that. Actually, virtually the entire world opposed that. Uh, almost everyone called for efforts at negotiations and diplomacy to head off the fearful bloodshed and the destruction that in fact took place, uh, culminating in a humanitarian catastrophe uh, caused by mainly by NATO bombing in Bani Walid and Nasirt. Those are the cities of the home base of the largest tribe in this tribal society. A catastrophe bitterly condemned by the Red Cross, but barely discussed here. Well, the condemnation of the quick resort to violence by NATO included the African Union. Libya is, of course, an African country. It included the BRICS, so-called BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the main so-called developing countries, happened to be meeting in China right then and issued a condemnation and a call for uh, negotiations and diplomacy. It was also condemned uh, by the International Crisis Group, highly respected organization that monitors uh, actions throughout the third world. It was in quite an important paper by its director for Africa, Hugh Roberts, London Review of Books, uh, the triumvirate, the imperial triumvirate, uh, appealed to R2P uh, totally without justification, but it's worth knowing that they were virtually alone, the usual situation. Uh, well, uh, let's return to the current cutoff of funds to UNESCO right now uh, to punish it for admitting Palestine. Uh, here, too, there's a history which involves of the United Nations, and they're worth thinking about. There are plenty of uh, hard problems in the world where it's difficult even to conjure up a possible solution, like uh, Kashmir or uh, Eastern Congo and others. Uh, but uh, Israel-Palestine is not one of them, contrary to what's said. There's a very straightforward settlement, and there's an overwhelming international consensus on it. And we know what it is. Uh, it's a, there should be a two-state settlement on the international border, the pre-June 1967 border, uh, with uh, maybe uh, minor and mutual modifications. It was a ceasefire line. That, in fact, was the official position of the United States back in the late 60s when it was still part of the world on these issues. Uh, and that's uh, almost just about every relevant uh, party agrees to this, with an exception, crucial exception. Actually, this proposal reached the Security Council of the United Nations in 1976. It was brought by the three Arab confrontation states, as they're called, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and brought a resolution to the Security Council uh, calling for what I just said, uh, for uh, uh, a settlement on the international border, which, uh, and then came, uh, they ad adopted the wording of UN 242, which 
everyone agrees is the basic diplomatic document. Uh, so they called for recognition of the right of every state in the region to exist in peace and security uh, with secure and recognized boundaries. That would include Israel and a new Palestinian state and the occupied territories. That's the international consensus. Uh, uh, Israel didn't refuse to attend the meeting. It did, in fact, it bombed Lebanon with no credible uh, reason, killed about 50 people. Uh, the U.S. Uh, vetoed the resolution. Well, when the United States vetoes a resolution, it's in fact a double veto. First of all, the resolution's finished, and secondly, it's vetoed from history. Uh, it's another one of the prerogatives of power. So you'll have to look pretty hard to find any a record of this, but it's there. And in fact, you can even find it on the New York Times and late January 1976 when the event took place. Uh, well, that's the first veto of a, uh, the international consensus on a political settlement. Uh, came up again in 1980, similar resolution, U.S. again vetoed it, it's under Carter. Then there's a, the, 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 with the Security Council essentially eliminated by the U.S. veto, uh, the international debate shifted to the General Assembly and almost annually, there's a resolution with somewhat similar content. Uh, if you look at the votes, it's uh, no, 144 to two uh, U.S. Israel, 151 to three uh, U.S. Israel and um, Micronesia, something like that. Now that's the regular pattern. I won't run through it. Uh, the, uh, there was an interesting change in 1988 and 89 which is very crucial. In 1988, the Palestinian National Council formally accepted the international consensus. That is, it accepted two-state settlement, uh, granting Israel all the rights of any state in the international system, and a Palestinian state next to it. Uh, Israel, of course, responded to that, responded in a very interesting way. A couple of months later, Israel came out with a formal declaration saying that uh, there can be no additional Palestinian state between Jordan and Israel. It's a very interesting phrase. Israel was declaring that Jordan is a Palestinian state. Now it happens that the Jordanians and the Palestinians don't happen to agree, but they're what are sometimes called unpeople. You know, it doesn't really matter what they say. Uh, so there is a Palestinian state, even though the, all the people in the area reject that conclusion, and there can't be another one. So no Palestinian state. Uh, went on to say that any, uh, uh, the, uh, any, uh, anything dealing with the uh, uh, occupied territories, West Bank and Gaza, uh, would have to be in accordance with the guidelines of the, uh, uh, of the Israeli government. Uh, furthermore, it said that there could be negotiations, but the, Palestine, the PLO, the, main, you know, the organization representing the Palestinians, couldn't be part of the negotiations. So Palestinians can participate, but they can't pick their uh, choice of uh, organization to enter into it. And any negotiations would have to be within the guidelines that Israel had said. Well, as always, it, uh, the important question is what the U.S. is going to do. And the U.S., in fact, reacted very quickly. In December 1989, the U.S. State Department came out with, a, with its uh, plan. It's called the Baker Plan, James Baker, the Secretary of State under Bush number one. And the Baker Plan simply reiterated the Israeli uh, declaration almost verbatim. So no additional Palestinian state. Uh, no Palestinians can't pick their own representatives. Uh, everything will have to be settled in accord with the guidelines of the State of Israel. That's uh, official U.S. policy in 1989. Uh, well, uh, and that's kind of out of history, too. It doesn't fit well with the proper imagery. Uh, shortly after that came the Oslo Agreements. Uh, the Os I won't go into the details, but they're interesting. The crucial part of the Oslo Agreements was that they undercut the Palestinian negotiators. Uh, 
there were negotiations going on uh, with uh, under U.S. aegis, of course, and there were Palestinian negotiators from inside the territories. Now, the Palestinian negotiations were led by uh, Haider Abdel Shafi. He's a, a highly respected, maybe the most respected figure in the territories, a dedicated nationalist, uh, not incorruptible, honest. And he was, uh, he had a conditions for the negotiations which Israel and the United States were not accepting. The primary condition was that uh, uh, that the settlement operations uh, had to cease. It's recognized that they're illegal, and he said we can't go on if the Israeli settlement continues in the occupied territories. He also called for a Palestinian state um, at the end of the negotiations. Well, that was undercut by the Oslo agreements. Uh, if you take a look at the Oslo agreements, these led, some of you will remember, to a meeting on the White House lawn uh, Bill Clinton standing with Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. The uh, press called it a day of awe, you know, amazing event. And they came out with what they called a Declaration of Principles. And if you look at the Declaration of Principles, which you can pick up on the internet, it's about two pages, uh, quite interesting. The Declaration of Principles, first of all, says nothing about ending settlements so they can continue. And it says that the end result of the negotiations will be uh, what is stipulated in UN 242. Now UN 242 says nothing about Palestinian rights, nothing. Palestinians are mentioned only as refugees. So that's the end result of the negotiations, no Palestinian national rights. That's the day of awe. Uh, there were people who there was a lot of euphoria, not everyone. My friend Edward Said, late Edward Said, condemned it. I wrote against it. But most importantly, Haider Abdel Shafi uh, uh, rejected it right away. He refused to appear at the White House ceremony because he was principled. Uh, he was not going to give up on everything. Uh, and in fact, the DOP, the Declaration of Principles, was a, a complete sellout. Well won't go on, but the settlements continued uh, right through the following years, they continued to grow. You take a look at the chart, they grew kind of linearly right through the 90s, continued more later. Uh, it's commonly claimed that Yitzhak Rabin, who was assassinated in 1995, uh, was a man of peace who was going to establish a Palestinian state. Now that's based on complete refusal to pay attention to the record. Uh, right before he was assassinated, Rabin addressed the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, and he repeated his long-standing position. I'll just read it to you. We are striving for a permanent solution to the unending bloody conflict between us and the Palestinians and the Arab states. We view the permanent solution in the framework of State of Israel which will include most of the area of the land of Israel as it was under the rule of the British Mandate, Jordan to the Sea, and alongside it a Palestinian entity which will be a home to most of the Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. We would like this to be an entity which is less than a state and which will independently run the lives of the Palestinians under its authority. The borders of the State of Israel during the permanent solution will be beyond the lines that existed before the Six-Day War, June 67. We will not return to the June 1967 lines, the international border. Now that was Rabin's stand right before he was assassinated. He was replaced by Shimon Peres, who repeated the same thing. Uh, he said there will, in office, he said there will never be a Palestinian state. Uh, he was replaced in 1996 by Benjamin Netanyahu, current prime minister re-elected, uh, who's considered an ultra-hawk. And in fact, the party program that he runs on states explicitly that there will never be a, any Palestinian self-determination west of the Jordan. A lot of talk about the Hamas Charter, which nobody pays attention to anywhere else. Uh, but this is the uh, 
party, formal position of the governing party. Uh, actually, Netanyahu is the first administration to recognize that maybe there could be a Palestinian state. Uh, when he came into office in 1996, uh, he, he was, his government was asked, uh, will you ever accept a Palestinian state? And the Minister of Information said, look, we're going to leave some fragments to the Palestinians somewhere. And if they want to call them a state, we don't care. Or they can call them fried chicken. Well, that's essentially the U.S.-Israeli position. Yeah, they can have fried chicken if they want. Uh, the settlements are all illegal, not just the expansion, but the existing ones. Uh, in there, that's tr been determined by every relevant international authority, Security Council, International Court of Justice. In fact, Israel itself agrees with it. Uh, in Jerusalem, what's called Jerusalem, which is vastly expanded beyond Jerusalem and illegally annexed, uh, their settlements are doubly illegal. Those are the ones that are going on today. They're doubly illegal because they're also in violation of explicit Security Council resolutions uh, not to modify the status of Jerusalem. Uh, well, why does this continue? Uh, for a very simple reason. It was set in the 1976 veto. Uh, the U.S. blocks any political settlement. Uh, it is the leader of the rejectionist camp, virtually alone, uh, along with Israel, in, among relevant actors. The most recent U.S. veto was February 2011, now that one aroused a little interest. Usually they're just ignored. Uh, because, and the reason was that what Obama vetoed was a resolution calling for official U.S. policy. Official U.S. policy is that there should be no more settlement expansion. Obama doesn't mean it. He's indicated to Netanyahu, you know, go ahead. But that's the official position. And the Security Council had a resolution calling for that, and Obama vetoed it. Well, that raised a few eyebrows. Uh, that uh, ended any discussion about settlement expansion. There's another veto threatened uh, any day now if the Security Council accepts the Palestinian bid, a bid for, uh, uh, for membership. Uh, uh, if it happens, uh, the U.S. isolation will be carried even further to really historic depths. I mean, Obama hasn't had many achievements in his presidency, but he's had one, which shouldn't be overlooked. He succeeded in becoming even more unpopular in the Arab world than George Bush was. That's a, quite an achievement. Bush was down to, I think, about 9% support. Obama's reached 5% in Egypt. Well, the United Nations has several pillars. Uh, the main one is the United Nations Charter. Its core principle is rejection of the threat or use of force in international affairs. It's, a, it's a, uh, Article 2.4. Uh, there are exceptions. The exceptions are if forces authorized by the Security Council or Article 51, if it's in self-defense against armed attack uh, until the Security Council can act. Uh, there's almost no example of that. The U.S. routinely rejects uh, this principle uh, so frequently and so brazenly that it's superfluous to give examples. In fact, right now it's violating it. The threats against Iran uh, are in violation of Article 2.4, which says condemns the threat or use of force. Now, the way it's framed in the case of Iran is all options are open which means we'll nuke you if we feel like it. Uh, that alone, even those words, are in violation of the Charter. And uh, the, uh, much more significantly, of course, is the resort to force, which happens all the time. Uh, another one of the pillars of the United Nations is the International Court of Justice. As I've mentioned, the U.S. Uh, exempted itself right away from ICJ jurisdiction on matters of real significance. And under Reagan, it extended. Uh, Reagan uh, uh, denied any authorization to the ICJ on any issue. 
Well, the last major pillar of the United Nations is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, December 10th, 1948. It's called Human Rights Day. Uh, it'll come in a few weeks, and you will hear rousing statements about our fervent dedication to hu the Universal Declaration and condemnations of enemies who routinely violate it. So let me end by taking a look at that. Uh, the Universal Declaration of uh, UD has three parts which are of equal significance, quite explicit. Uh, the three parts are civil and political rights, uh, socioeconomic rights, and cultural rights. The US formally accepts the civil and political rights, but only formally. It often violates them in quite interesting ways. Go into it if you like. The cultural rights, uh, the US uh, dismisses without comment. They're not even discussed, so they're out. The socioeconomic rights are the most interesting case. Uh, there, the United States explicitly rejects them. I mentioned just a few illustrations. Uh, in April 2005, the United States cast the sole vote against the uh, UN resolutions on the right to food and the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. That reiterates Article 25 of the Universal Declaration, core socioeconomic rights. It was the sole veto. Uh, one month before that, the Under Secretary of State, Paula Dobriansky, presented the State Department's annual report on human rights around the world. If you read it, she affirmed very eloquently, I'm quoting her, that promoting human rights is not just an element of our foreign policy, it's the bedrock of our policy and our foremost concern. Uh, Dobriansky had already explained her concept of human rights. This was in her capacity as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs in the Reagan and Bush number one administrations. Now there she sought to dispel what she called myths about human rights. Now the most salient myth is that the so-called economic and social rights constitute human rights. That's a third of the UD. Now she denounced the effort quoting her to obfuscate human rights discourse by introducing these spurious rights, which are entrenched in the Universal Declaration, but which the Reagan and Bush administrations explicitly rejected. Uh, Reagan's UN ambassador, Jean Kirkpatrick, dismissed socioeconomic rights as a letter to Santa Claus. I just dis don't disregard them. Uh, under Bush one, a UN ambassador, Mars Abram, cast the sole veto of the UN right to development, which closely paraphrased Article 25. Uh, according to Abram, this is little more than an empty vessel into which vague hopes and inchoate expectations can be poured. It's preposterous and even a dangerous incitement. Actually, that's a fairly consistent stance through all administrations more explicit in rejection under the Republican administrations, but it passes unnoticed. In fact, rejection of the Universal Declaration is so deeply ingrained in consciousness that the New York Times editors can actually publish an editorial on Human Rights Day which condemns the Asian countries that because they reject the Universal Declaration and they call instead, I'm quoting, for addressing the more basic needs for people for food and shelter, medical care and schooling, as called for by the Universal Declaration. So according to the Times editors, by calling for core elements of the UD, uh, the Asian countries are rejecting the UD. It's an interesting indication of how far we've gone in uh, denying the most elementary principles of the United Nations, or moral principles for that matter. Uh, well, uh, this is by no, not even close to an exhaustive review of the United States and the UN. I think it's a pretty fair sample, though. You can check and see.
Uh, these are at to it's a topic that I think should be of considerable concern to us as U.S. citizens who are responsible for uh, what our government does in the world. Actually, the review, I think, suggests a modification of the announced title for this evening. Uh, perhaps a more apt title would have been the United States versus the United Nations, where the term United States here does not refer to the population, but to the political leadership and a substantial sector, in fact, the large majority of the articulate intellectual world, including the media. Uh, th that gap uh, also ought to concern us. It's one of many illustrations of a very sharp and growing disconnect between public opinion and public policy. Uh, some of them happen to be in the headlines exactly today with regard to the Deficit Commission. Matter would be interesting to pursue, but a different one. The disconnect between public opinion and public policy uh, always serves as a measure of the extent to which formal democracy actually functions. The greater the disconnect, the less it's functioning. That's another matter which I think we should find quite troublesome. Thanks. <laughs> I'd be uh, curious to know if you think the Occupy Wall Street movement signals that we're on the verge or perhaps already in a legitimation crisis in the Habermasian sense of the word. I think we've been in a legitimation crisis for a long time. Uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street and the whole set of movements like it around the country, in fact, around the world, is a reaction to a long-standing crisis of uh, a, uh, illegitimacy of uh, political and uh, economic institutions. Uh, it's taking the reaction to this illegitimacy is taking different forms in different parts of the world. Uh, so, for example, in the last decade, the uh, South America, uh, which had been the most uh, rigorous and uh, respected adherent of the so-called neoliberal programs, the programs of the Treasury Department, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and had suffered severely for it. They lost decades of development. Uh, they just broke free. Uh, for example, Argentina refused to pay its debt. Uh, other countries broke free in other ways. Uh, they've thrown out all the U.S. military bases. In fact, the U.S. has lost South America, much as it lost China in 1949. Uh, that's a significant reaction against uh, the whole array of social and political programs and economic programs that are roughly called neoliberal. I mean, they vary in the way they apply in different places. Uh, take, say, Egypt. Uh, that's, been, that's what's been happening the last year in, in uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa, what's called MENA, Middle East North Africa region. So, for example, in Egypt, uh, these same programs uh, had been instituted in the 1980s. That's when most of them were instituted around the world and uh, had the usual impact. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF were very praised Egypt uh, very highly. In fact, shortly before everything collapsed, uh, they were producing reports describing Egypt as, you know, the kind of poster child for neoliberalism. Everything was working beautifully, wonderful reforms. Uh, what was happening was the usual. It enriched a small sector of the population and impoverished and undermined everybody else. And now there's a reaction. That's not the only reason for the reaction. It's also a reaction against dictatorships, but it's a large part of it and uh, the same throughout much of the region. And other things are happening in Europe, which are sort of the same, the indignados in Spain, uh, in uh, Greece. The Occupy movements here are the first manifestation, organized manifestation, of uh, significant protest against similar policies which have been applied in the United States. Now, when policies apply in the richest country of the world, 
it's different than when they apply in Egypt or uh, you know uh, Argentina or somewhere else. Uh, but it's similar. Uh, the policies have been designed to achieve exactly what they've achieved, to enrich a tiny sector of the population. You look at the United States over the last 30 years. There's a big change in the economy in the United States in the past 30 years, just as there was uh, when the neoliberal programs hit other parts of the world. So in the 1950s and the 60s were the greatest growth period in economic history. And the growth was egalitarian. So lowest quintile did about as good as the upper quintile. Now, there were also steps forward towards uh, uh, kind of vaguely social democratic so welfare state measures, uh, giving rights to larger parts of the population. Uh, by the early 70s, that was beginning to change. Uh, with Reagan, it changed dramatically. Uh, in the last generation, uh, very radical change. For most of the population, it's been stagnation, sometimes decline. Uh, for a very small percentage, mostly coming from the financial institutions, it's been extraordinary wealth. Uh, uh, everyone knows the United States is unequal, in fact, unparalleled in inequality. But what's less known is that inequality is largely driven by about one-tenth of one percent of the population. You know, hedge fund managers and CEOs of financial corporations and so on. Now, they're sp spectacularly rich. And all of this has been combined with set in motion a kind of a vicious cycle in which uh, economic power is highly ca concentrated. That leads, of course, to concentration of political power, which provides legislation which accelerates the process. And we've, uh, the, the whole system is so illegitimate and understood to be illegitimate that by now uh, uh, approval of Congress is in single digits. This goes back quite a few years, but it's going way down. Uh, same with the executive, same with virtually every other institution. Well, Occupy Wall Street is a reaction to this, uh, different, taking different forms than the reaction to similar policies in different parts of the world. But yeah, it's a reaction. Where will it go? You never know where it'll go. Depends on how much commitment and dedication there is, how far it can. Uh, it's a very atomized society. So the question is, can it? help organize and mobilize people to struggle for their own rights the way it's been done in other countries. We'll have to see. Thank you. Yes, you spoke about the great uh, chasm between uh, the expressed will of the American people and what actually happens, and that relationship between what the people have expressed and what the government does, I don't think has ever been greater. And I'm wondering, what can the, uh, in, in your opinion, what can the American people do? Uh, what steps can they take to take back their government, which seems estranged from the average person now? Well, we can do almost anything. This isn't Egypt. You know, if Americans decide to mobilize and organize to try to reconstruct some kind of functioning democracy, uh, they're not going to be met by the military in Tahrir Square. You know, uh, there's too much freedom has been won for that to happen. I mean, there are cases of police brutality and so on, but it's nothing like the repression that's faced by people in uh, much more uh, harsh and authoritarian societies. So basically, it's open. We can do what we like. You know, not easy. You know, there'll be punishments and so on, but uh, and nothing like punishments that existed in the past or that exist elsewhere. You should remember that the United States, for example, one thing that has to be done is to rebuild the labor movement. Now, this is not the first time in American history that the labor movement has been virtually crushed. Uh, it's happened several times. In fact, there's a, one of the major books on labor history by David Montgomery, one of the primary labor historians. It's called, I think, something like the rise and fall of the labor movement in the United States. And the fall that he's talking about is in the 1920s. In the 1920s, the labor movement had been virtually destroyed by Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare and other repressive operations. So there was just almost nothing left. Well, it uh, reconstituted itself in the 1930s very dramatically and, in fact, uh, spearheaded 
the, what became the New Deal programs. And by the time that uh, the CIO was getting organized and uh, the workers were just sitting in on factories, uh, that's terrifying to business. When workers sit in on factories, that's one step, sit down strikes, that's one step before taking them over and saying goodbye, we're, we don't need you, you know, we're gonna run them ourselves. Uh, that's, uh, as soon as that started to happen, then you started getting significant New Deal legislation and plenty of other things were happening like it. Uh, repression then was still pretty brutal. I mean, American labor history is extremely violent and much more so than other countries, other industrial countries. Uh, and as late as the late 30s, workers were still getting murdered for striking. Okay, that's not happening anymore. Uh, there's been improvements and uh, uh, plenty of things can be done. I mean, right now it's very critical to uh, the, the, uh, the labor movement has been, in the private sector, the labor movement has been very much weakened, uh, mostly by uh, illegal actions of the government, primarily under Reagan, but then it continued. Uh, Reagan basically told, you know, the, the owners and investors, you can do whatever you like, you want to violate laws, we're not going to pay any attention to you. Uh, so the number of uh, illegal firings for organizing attempts escalated sharply under Reagan, went up more under Clinton, under Bush, so even more. Uh, public sector unions still have maintained themselves and have maintained rights, and now they're under attack. That's what's going on right now. Scott Walker, you know, Christie, the whole business. There's, uh, these are attacks on the public sector unions, the last stronghold. And it's because uh, business understands very well that the, uh, the main uh, organized barrier to uh, uh, you know, almost total destruction of the democratic system is an organized labor movement. Well, a lot can be done to defend and restore that. And the same with uh, um, you know, the political system has become kind of a joke. I mean, not only are elections bought, but uh, in Congress, uh, if uh, somebody in Congress wants to have a position of some influence, a head of a committee, it used to, when the political system was kind of functioning, uh, you got those positions through seniority, service, and so on. That's gone. Uh, now you have to buy them. You have to pay money into the car, uh, party coffers in order to get a chairmanship or something. And this is c utterly corrupted Congress, White Houses, the White House just follows the dictates of the financial institutions. I'm not exaggerating, but it's pretty close. And uh, 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 all of that can be changed. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, we can also go back to the days of, uh, that were beginning in the 1930s of takeover of uh, industrial production. And there are cases of it. Uh, there are cases uh, where we have been come pretty close to uh, workers taking over, workers and communities uh, taking over industry and producing things that can be needed. And that, if there was enough public support, that could have been done in the last few years. So for example, when Obama took over the auto industry, it was basically nationalized. Uh, and uh, there were a couple of paths that could have been followed. Uh, one path was the one that was followed. Uh, reconstitute it, uh, give it back to essentially the same, you know, banks, management, and so on, a couple of different names. That was one way. The public paid for that. An alternative was to hand it over to communities and the workforce and have them uh, a turn to producing things that the country very badly needs, like, say, high-speed rail. Uh, skilled workers in uh, the Rust Belt uh, have the capacity uh, with a little help to do that and the country badly needs it and they need the jobs and that uh, rebuilds a popular movement which can be again on the forefront of change. That's, these are possibilities and across the board there's an, any number of things we can do. So I, I don't think there's any shortage of opportunities. There's a shortage of uh, dedication to making use of those opportunities. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, he took my question, but uh, do you support Ron Paul? And uh, what corporations do you think lead ethical practices that 
if any. <laughs> I mean, Ron Paul's a nice guy. I, <laughs> if I had to have dinner with one of the Republican candidates, I'd prefer to have it with him. But his policies are off the wall. You know? I mean, sometimes I agree with him. You know, like I think we ought to end the war in Afghanistan. But if you look at the other policies, I mean, it's kind of shocking. Uh, so for, and, and the principles that lie behind them, you know, I, I don't know what to say about them. So let, uh, you probably saw or maybe read in the Republican debates at one point, and this kind of brought out who he is. Yeah. He was asked, uh, he's against federal involvement in health in anything. You know? right. He was asked uh, something like, uh, well, what about, what if some guy's in a coma and uh, uh, he's going to die and he never took out insurance, uh, what should happen? Well, his first answer was something like, uh, it's a tribute to our liberty. Okay, so if he dies, that's a tribute to how free we are. Right. He kind of backed off from that. Uh, actually, it was a huge applause when he said that. But after later reactions from elsewhere, he backed off and said, well, uh, the church will take care of him or charities will take care of him or something or other, so it's not a problem. All right. I mean, this is just savagery. Yeah. And it goes across the board. In fact, this holds for the whole so-called libertarian ideology. I mean, you know, it may sound nice on the surface, but if you think it through, it's just a call for corporate tyranny. Yeah. It takes away any barrier to uh, corporate tyranny. It's a, a step towards the worst. But, right. but, we, but it's all academic, because the business world would never permit it to happen, since it would destroy the economy. I mean, they can't live without a powerful nanny state. They know it. You know. Yeah, I like how you said, uh, if you want to see who the next president is going to be, just look at how much money is backing them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that's been true for a long time. Sorry, uh, I got to. It's, it's basically true, I mean, and more and more true over the years that elections are essentially bought. They're sort of charades. Uh, what's more, you know, I mean, intellectuals pretend not to believe, not to understand it. But there are people who understand it very well. For example, I think most of the population understands it. Another group that understands it very well is the advertising industry, the guys who run this, the campaigns. So as maybe you know, in 2008, uh, after Obama's victory, uh, the uh, American advertising industry had its annual meeting. Uh, every year they give an award for the best marketing campaign of the year. They gave it to Obama. He beat out Apple Computer. If you read the business press, they understood that this is just a marketing campaign, like you know, selling toothpaste. Uh, and since they were running it, they understand it. Uh, they, in fact, if you read the business press, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they, there was just you know a lot of excitement about how this is going to change the atmosphere in corporate boardrooms. We're going to behave a little bit differently. Now we have a different model as to how to delude people and uh, right. gain what we want. I mean, they're not confused. There's no reason for us to be. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, just kind of returning to foreign policy here. You talked about in your, uh, your address earlier about briefly touched on the really current tensions um, between Iran and Israel. Pardon? The tensions between Iran and Israel? Yes. And I'm, I was just wondering, like, what your current assessment of them, of that situation was, and if you could speculate on uh, what you think future developments might be. Hmm. Well, you know, Iran uh, is described in, in general political discourse and in the international affairs literature as the greatest threat to world peace. Here it is, not the rest of the world, not, not in the global south. So, for example, in, uh, say, Egypt, in the Arab world, where they don't like Iran at all, uh, they re about maybe 10% regard Iran as a threat. Uh, overwhelmingly, they regard the United States and Israel as the major threats. Uh, but in uh, the United States and Israel, a couple of US allies, Iran is regarded as the greatest threat to world peace. Well, you know, Iran is a threat to its own population. I mean, it's a rotten government. It's uh, like a lot of others. And it definitely is a threat to its own population. But a question you might ask yourself is, what's the threat to world peace? OK, everyone says that it's the major threat to world peace. So OK, what's the threat? Uh, well, if you look closely, you'll notice there's very little discussion about. It's just it's a threat. We have to accept that it's a threat. 
Actually, there's an authoritative answer to that. You want to find the actual answer? Uh, take a look at the presentations to Congress by the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence. Uh, every year, they give a presentation to Congress on global security. And they run through the countries of the world, and of course, they include Iran. So take a look. You know, it's all up on the internet. Uh, what they say is, uh, Iran is not a military threat. Uh, the Iranian military budget is very low, even by the standards of the region. I mean, minuscule as compared to us or Israel. Uh, but even by the standards of the region, it's low. Uh, furthermore, their, their strategic doctrine is defensive. It's for deterrence. Their military is deployed, their military is developed in order to try to deter an invasion long enough for diplomacy to set in. Uh, then they turn to uh, the nuclear issue, and they say if Iran is developing nuclear capability, which they don't know, nuclear weapons capability, it would be part of their deterrent strategy. Let's try an effort to kind of fend off attacks from others. And that's the threat. The threat is that there, there could be a deterrent to the United States and Israel. They might make it harder for the U.S. and Israel to carry out aggression freely elsewhere or other crimes. That's the threat. That tells us a lot about ourselves, if that's the threat. And see if you can find another threat. So yeah, rotten government, threat to their own population, uh, uh, not alone in that respect by any means. But it's very hard to see what further threat they are. I mean, suppose Iran had nuclear weapons. I mean, no sane analyst thinks that they would ever use them. In fact, if they so much as armed a missile with a nuclear weapon, the country would be blown away. You know? I mean, they, they can't do anything with a nuclear weapon. Uh, all this business about a, you know, a missile, uh, anti-missile uh, uh, shields in Turkey and Europe and so on because we have to deter Iran, that's not even a bad joke. Of course they're not going to use a weapon. They'll be wiped out. And whatever you think about the clerics, they don't want their country destroyed and everything they own destroyed. Uh, why, is the US, why are the U.S. and Israel so upset about them? Well, because they are a deterrent. Uh, uh, Iran, with regard to Israel, uh, Iran uh, does arm uh, Hezbollah, which is a deterrent to another U.S.-Israeli uh, invasion of Lebanon. And Israel doesn't like that. They want to be free to invade Lebanon without a deterrent. So that's the tension. Uh, what's going to happen? Pretty hard to say. Uh, in the case of uh, the United States is issuing constant threats. You know, almost everyone says all options are open. That's a threat, a uh, threat of nuclear attack, in fact. Uh, furthermore, the U.S. is building up uh, uh, military forces to attack Iran. It's uh, the island of, there's an island, Diego Garcia, in the Indian Ocean, which is it's actually an African island, but it was a former British possession. And Britain handed it over to the United States after th kicking out the population uh, uh, for a big military base. It's one of the main US military bases for uh, bombing in Middle East and Central Asia. And uh, Obama has been building it up very fast. Uh, he uh, expanded its uh, capacities to hold, to maintain uh, the nuclear submarines, that submarines with nuclear missiles. Uh, he's been, he, uh, George Bush, num number two, had uh, begun the development of uh, what are called bunker busters, deep penetration bombs, you know, go deep into the ground. They're just aimed at Iran. But it kind of languished under Bush. As soon as Obama came in, he immediately radically accelerated the production of these things. They went way beyond what had been planned. And they're now being dispatched to uh, Diego Garcia and also to Israel. Okay, that's a very definite threat, serious threat against Iran. They're not designed for anyone else. And in other ways, uh, yeah, they're building up the forces for a possible attack. I don't frankly think they'll do it. Uh, the consequences would be unpredictable, but very possibly horrendous and harmful to uh, the U.S. and Israel. In fact, if you look at Israel, uh, it's very serious. There have been a, 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 the former 
t former top intelligence people, you know, former heads of Mossad and so on, have been coming out with very strong statements, uh, warning against uh, any military attack in uh, Iran. As far as the public record indicates, the top brass, you know, top military and top intelligence, former intelligence, is strongly against it. But that doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, the political leadership is unpredictable. Can't tell what they'll do. In fact, these guys wouldn't be coming out with their statements if they didn't think that there was a danger. These are people who re very rarely talk in public. And when they come out with these warnings, that means they have some inkling that something's going on. So who knows? Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the uh, military intervention in Libya, um, do you think it was uh, appropriate? You said it was inappropriate for the United States to act because it violated international law. But do you actually think Gaddafi would have uh, gone through diplomatic means to have a peace treaty with the rebels who, before the inter before NATO and Sweden intervened, that didn't have any bargaining so, chips? There's only one way to find out, and that was be to try. Uh, that's why most of the world, uh, in fact, almost every one relevant, was calling for efforts to try. And in fact, uh, Gaddafi had made some offers in that direction. If you, uh, would they have worked? I mean, I don't know. Uh, but you don't know until you try. Uh, you might want to read the uh, article that I mentioned. This is the most, probably the most important article on Libya by uh, Hugh Roberts, who's the head of the International Crisis Group for North Africa, is specialist on topic. He's reflecting the views of the International Crisis Group, the serious independent group, and he goes through all of this asking what the likelihood was. It's in the London Review of Books about uh, an issue or two ago. You can pick it up on the internet. I think it, I don't agree with everything he says. I don't think it's all convincing, but it's uh, probably the most illuminating article on the topic that has come out yet. And then you can draw your own conclusions. Thank you. Good evening. Um, since 9-11, ha have you noticed a massive militarization of our police forces? A you, uh, militarization of our police forces in the United States? And is it our right with the Occupy movement to start pushing the boundaries further on what free speech is and isn't? Uh, since 9-11, uh, have you noticed uh, a massive militarization of the police force? So have there been militarization of the police in the United States since 9-11? Yes, and is it our right well, with the yeah. Occupy movement to I mean, push those boundaries that, further? Also a massive increase in surveillance, uh, uh, you know, airport security, uh, the checking up on people. Uh, some of it's kind of comical in many ways. I mean, I happened to be in Australia a couple of weeks ago, and. One of the guys who was I have a friend there who's a former Australian intelligence officer, a member of the Special Forces, and he pointed out to me that you know, f one of the most lethal instruments you can have on you is a fountain pen. He said, if you, if you know what you're doing, you can kill somebody with a fountain pen in no time. Well, they don't take your fountain pens away. You know, they take your toothpaste away. I mean, it's, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the, the idea, it's very questionable that all of this has anything to do with security. Uh, but it does intimidate and control people, and the surveillance is incredible. I mean, you can be pretty confident that, you know, any time you write an email, it's going to the National Security Agency. And with uh, Obama, it's gotten a lot worse. And so Obama has... Uh, introduced measures which haven't gotten too much discussion, but they're pretty serious. Uh, there's uh, one that you might want to look up is uh, a Supreme Court case, Holder versus uh, Humanitarian Law Project. Humanitarian Law Project is a legal aid project, which uh, uh, in the case in question, it happened to be giving legal advice to the PKK a Turkish group, Turkish guerrilla group. And the advice was basically, you know, the advice wasn't telling them how to carry out terror. In fact, it was against it. Uh, well, that, that case was brought by the Obama administration to the Supreme Court. It was argued by Kagan, um, 
his latest uh, appointment to the Supreme Court. With the support of the right-wing justices, they won. And the court decision uh, makes it, uh, extends the concept of material support for terror to include words. So if you give, if you advise, if there's a group that's on the U.S. terrorist list, and you advise them to turn to nonviolence, you're giving them material support, and therefore you can be tossed into jail, you know, literally. Uh, a lot of us could be subject to this law any time. Uh, and so like, you might ask the question, what's the terrorist list? I mean, it's taken for granted without comment that this list is legitimate, is it? I mean, Nelson Mandela was on the terrorist list until two years ago. Uh, is that legitimate? Uh, the African National Congress under Reagan and Thatcher was uh, one of the more notorious terrorist organizations in the world. Um, if you want to see how arbitrary this is, take a look at the details. Uh, in 1982, uh, Reagan wanted to start sending arms to his friend Saddam Hussein. Uh, well, Saddam and other aid. Uh, Saddam was on the terrorist list, so they took him off the terrorist list. That made it possible for Donald Rumsfeld to go for his handshake and start sending aid to Saddam. This went right through his worst atrocities, all supported by the United States, attack on the Kurds, everything else. Uh, they had a gap in the terrorist list. They had to fill it. So they put Cuba on the terrorist list, uh, maybe because Cuba has been the target of more international terrorism than probably all other countries uh, combined from the United States. I mean, the thing is totally arbitrary. It has no supervision. It has no legitimacy. Uh, if you're put on it, you can't do anything about it. The, the Attorney General doesn't need any evidence. I mean, the idea that this list should even exist is a serious uh, blemish on civil rights, uh, rec on our civil rights record. And the idea that it should be used to extend the concept material support to things like giving legal aid, aid or advice to turn to nonviolence, that's pretty, that's pretty outrageous. And it's been used. Uh, this decision was immediately used by the FBI to uh, attack uh, 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 groups that were supporting uh, Palestinian rights in, in the Midwest. Well, those things are dangerous. Uh, it's a serious erosion of basic rights. I don't know if the police have been all that much militarized. I mean, certainly to some extent, but I think the general attack on civil rights is much more serious. And then, sure, 9 11 is pretext for it. Thank you. My question actually was very similar to his. Um, since the rejection of socioeconomic rights is so fundamental to U.S. policy, um, how far do you think the government, the federal government, state governments, municipal governments will go in the repression of the Wall Street occupiers? Um, I was reading that supposedly there was a conference call with 18 uh, heads of municipalities along with the FBI and Homeland Security. There seemed to be a coordinated crackdown on the yeah. occupiers using seemingly increasing levels of brutality. Um, what's your assessment of the situation and how far do you think that will go? I think that depends on people like us. The more support they have, the less likely the government is to turn to repression. If support dwindles and they're kind of isolated, yeah, then they can go in and wipe them out. Uh, so usual thing, same with the civil rights movement, same with any, any war movement, you know, any popular movement. If it doesn't have substantial, broad support, then it's much easier to repress. If it does have it, it can resist repression. Again, this isn't Egypt. You know, they're not going to come down with, with the army in Tahrir Square. Well, they did use uh, I, the long-range the long acoustic device, which... I, I think we, we, we're... Uh, if I can, yeah. I, they're going to try, but um, the general... There's a general principle. The more popular support there is, particular support among, you know, what are called respectable people, you know, people like us, uh, the more support there is from people who it's hard to repress without a cost, the safer they are. Great. Thanks. I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Sure. Yes. 
Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you for taking my question. With the uh, portrait you portray of the United States as this rogue nation, pretty much doing what it wants, and then with the examples you give of the major media outlets seeming to fall right in line with some sort of support uh, for the elite's decisions, and then coupled with just all the information we're bombarded with, everybody's got a YouTube video saying they know what the truth is. What information outlets do you support or where do you think are the outlets we can actually get the true unbiased uh, reports of what's really going on out there in the world? I'm asked that a lot. I never really know what the answer. I mean, everyone, whoever they are, me, you, everybody else, and we all have a point of view. I mean, uh, people who don't like our point of view call it a bias. Okay, uh, people who do like it say, you know, honest, uh, so and so. Uh, but uh, for you, say, uh, you've got to. Rec I mean, a person who's honest will make his point of view clear. Okay, then people can judge. Here's where I'm coming from. Now you can judge whether you you can see whether it's distorted or not because you know where it's coming from. Now, people who are either dishonest or maybe naive pretend that they are purely objective. They have no point of view. Now, that's the way the media run, pretty much. We're purely objective. We have no point of view at all. Of course, it's nonsense. Uh, but if, if they're honest, they'll say, look, here's the point of view we're coming from. Uh, uh, you can kind of discern it from the coverage, but it ought to be out front. But it's really up to the consumer of information to determine. You've got to read. I personally am not impressed with uh, information that comes through, say, YouTube, and I don't use it myself. I, th I think it's, it tends to be pretty superficial, frankly. I mean, it's got its value, but I, I think you don't get very far with it. You just have to read widely, carefully, critically, open mind. You know, uh, you can learn from a whole range of things. I mean, you can. You learn a lot from reading um, the Wall Street Journal, the business press, uh, uh, yeah. uh, right-wing journals, uh, left-wing journals. I mean, you just have to use your own discernment. There isn't any, um, there's no algorithm. There's no particular tricks. It's kind of like in the sciences. You just have to figure out where you're getting something that makes sense to you and that uh, you think you can build on. Thank you very much. Um, you've mentioned um, U.S. relations with the Middle East. And, the one? Uh, you've talked about. You talked about um, U.S. relations with the uh, Middle East and uh, Asian Pacific countries, but you didn't really talk about anything about Africa. I know you briefly touched about um, atrocities going on in the Eastern Congo, but uh, could you talk even for a moment about what's what's going on with Africom or? the troops that Obama sent into Uganda and the buildup in Ethiopia and whatnot. That's very important. In fact, if you look over the last, uh, uh, just add, to add a little historical depth to it, in 1945, uh, when the U.S. was essentially running the world, it did lay out plans for every place in the world. Uh, each region of the world was assigned what was called its function in the overall system that the United States was developing. So the function of Southeast Asia was to provide uh, resources and material uh, to the former colonial powers uh, so that they could then re rebuild and purchase U.S. manufacturing exports and so on. And for the U.S. too, the U.S. wanted the tin and rubber and so on, and so on throughout the world. This was done by George Kennan's uh, and his policy planning staff. Uh, when Kennan got to Africa, uh, he concluded that uh, we're not really that much interested in Africa, so we'll give it to the Europeans to exploit, his word, we'll give it to the Europeans to exploit for their reconstruction. Well, you know, you look at the history of Europe and Africa, you might think of a different possible relationship, but that never came up. Well, over the years that changed. Within a couple of decades, the U.S. started being interested in Africa for its resources, strategic positions, and so on. Uh, by now, uh, a lot of U.S. Uh, energy that comes from West Africa, 
supporting horrible dictatorships like Obiang and others, uh, and all kind of atrocities like what goes on in Nigeria. But, uh, the, and, and they are trying to set up military uh, systems. So there's two, AFRICOM, you know, the African military system, which is a system which extends over the world. They're trying to find bases in both East and West Africa for uh, AFRICOM, so on far they haven't really found them. There's a good chance, in fact, it's worth keeping your eyes open, that uh, Libya will end up being one of the bases. In fact, that may have been part of the motivation for uh, entering the war in Libya. Uh, hasn't happened yet. Uh, sending the troops to Uganda is, uh, it's worth keeping your eye on. I mean, the pretext was uh, to fight the Lord Resistance Army, but that's pretty hard to believe. I mean, whatever that army is, it's waned. Its power was years ago. They didn't send troops then. Uh, probably it's aimed at Sudan, South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan has, is, is, it's kind of unsettled, very much so, but has plenty of oil, and everybody's trying to get their fingers in it. And they may be aimed at that. It may be a preliminary to trying to set up an African base. So I think you, what you're saying is, very important to look at, to keep your eye on how this is developing, and to try to prevent it from being a recolonization of Africa. Now that's what a lot of Africans are concerned about, and with justice. Thank you. Okay, I, think, I think we're going to have to... I mean, I might just make a comment about Eastern Congo. Eastern Congo is, you know, the worst atrocities of the last couple of years. I mean, millions of people have been slaughtered. Uh, why isn't anything done about it? Well, you know, there's a couple of, I mean, there is an African Union group, but why aren't the Western powers doing anything? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, for one thing, the major culprit in Eastern Congo is Rwanda, which is a US client. Well, that's one reason to let it alone. The other reason is uh, your cell phone and everyone else's, uh, you know, uh, similar things. A lot of the minerals for them that come from Eastern Congo, and the multinational corporations are all over the place, They're ripping off uh, resources from there, and they use the militias to carve out territory for them, and they're making plenty of money out, out of it. And as long as that goes on, I don't think there's going to be much in the way of sensible uh, the involvement to try to negotiate a settlement of these horrible conflicts. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm sure um, I and, and many people here would like to uh, stay for another two hours and okay. continue to ask questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for the questions that you answered. And